Ah, Sweden. This is a country that I personally have an affinity for, being of Swedish heritage myself. My grandmother coming to the mighty north of Canada many years ago. I've even traveled there to visit relatives a couple times in my younger years, and it's always been an ambition of mine to return. But after making this video, I'm starting to reconsider. These are some of Sweden's most despicable, unheard of serial killers. The brutal murder of Katrina de Costa, a sex worker in the red light district in Stockholm, Sweden, began the case against a pair of very unlikely suspects. Over a five-year period between 1982 and 1987, at least seven prostitutes solicited by the night-stalking pair were pulled from the streets and seedy nightclubs. Dismembered and bloodless bodies were found strewn around fields, parks, and ravines in the city suburbs, and the deaths of two socialites and a Japanese student were also believed to be the work of the same pair. But what the investigating detectives were unprepared for was the identity of the perpetrator. The medical mind they had been searching for was none other than their friend and valued colleague, Dr. Teet Harem, the senior police medical examiner. Harem was one of the world's most respected pathologists, and his best friend, Dr. Thomas Algin, was a family doctor and dermatologist. At their trial, information was brought forth that shocked the entire nation. Dr. Harem was regularly called in to perform official autopsies on his own victims. The good doctor had a few skeletons scattered around his office as well, literally. He kept the skulls and brains of some of his victims and the heart of his young wife on prominent display, as he's also believed to be responsible for the death of his wife, Anne Catherine, but the death was officially ruled a suicide. The body of sex worker Annika Morris was found in Hagenston Park, and under a bridge leading to the suburb of Salmatuna, police found the body of Christine Krayash. In both cases, Dr. Harem performed the autopsies, showing nothing but cold detachment to the investigators. During this time, Lena Granz and her close friend, television announcer Katz Falk, were reported missing. Shortly after, prostitute Lena Beauforce dropped some interesting information on the police. She told them the murders were being committed by a team, and she thought she knew who they were. But that visit to the police station was to be her last. She was never found, and neither was the next victim, Loda Svensson. Detectives out of anger, anguish, and overwhelming frustration began cross-checking and re-interviewing more than 600 streetwalkers. The description of a boyish-looking, well-dressed young man kept appearing, as did the mention of a white Volkswagen rabbit that he drove. One terrified young woman, who refused to be identified in any way, told police that she had been beaten by a client matching the same description before having sex, then he dropped her off at her home as if nothing had happened. The quick-witted and badly abused woman had the presence of mind to note the attacker's appearance and clothing, as well as the license plate number off the VW Rabbit. When police ran a check on the number, it turned out to be none other than the medical examiner, Dr. Harem. It was at this time that the police put the good doctor under heavy surveillance and did a thorough background check on him. The bizarre story of his wife's death came to light a short time later. She was found hanging from the end of her bed by Harem and, coincidentally, the lady he moved in with not long after his wife's death. Detectives were stunned when they confiscated copies of the medical journal The Lancet, in which the ambitious pathologist had actually published studies of his own crimes. But despite this evidence, the case against Harem was entirely circumstantial and it was eventually thrown out of court, temporarily. Harem was fired from his job with no official reason given, and he set himself up in a private business where he attracted a popular practice, listing a large number of attractive young women. In 1985, the skeletons of Lena Granz and Katz Falk were found in Lena's submerged car under Hamarby Dock. They were positively identified, but the cause of their deaths was never fully investigated. In 1986, a copycat murder in Copenhagen, Denmark was reported. Japanese student Tezugo Toyanaga was tortured, strangled, and mutilated by a skilled hand. Again, the case was too circumstantial to take to court. In an assumed unrelated case, charges were brought against Dr. Thomas Algin by his estranged wife concerning the sexual molestation of his five-year-old daughter. The psychologically disturbed Karen Algin was interviewed by social workers trying to get to the root cause of the abuse. 
Even though the child was only two years old when the murders had occurred, Karen was able to recount the grisly murder of Katrina da Costa in graphic detail, as only someone who witnessed the event could. Elgin pled guilty to the incest charges and admitted his part in the da Costa murder. He claimed to be a willing part of Harem's vigilantes, that they lured prostitutes to the city morgue. And not only did they torture and mutilate their victims, they also practiced cannibalism, blood consumption, and necrophilia. On September 16, 1988, the jury convicted Harem of the da Costa murder and sentenced him to life in prison. Unfortunately, the trial was overturned on a technicality by the Swedish Supreme Court. When the retrial was held in May and both defendants were found not guilty, odd as it may sound, the court wrote that reasonable cause existed to find the defendants guilty, yet both men were released. Tor Hedden was born in Storahari near Kavling. He committed his first crime in September of 1943 when he broke into a local brewery near his parental home to steal some oats. To avoid detection, he then burned down the brewery to hide his crime. This was a method he later used to cover his tracks when he committed far more serious crimes. Heaton's next attack would be on November 28, 1951, when he robbed and murdered his friend John Allen Nilsson after a poker game at Nilsson's home in Jornarp. To cover his tracks, he burned down the crime scene, and as he was the local police representative, he took part in the investigation and even answered questions from the national media concerning the case. In the summer of 1952, Ola Osberg, his girlfriend, broke off their engagement. Infuriated, Hedden assaulted, handcuffed, and threatened to kill her with his pistol. He was subsequently fired for this incident, along with reportedly stealing towels from the local hospital. On the night of August 21, 1952, he went on a killing spree, after Osberg refused to take him back again after numerous attempts to win her over. His first stop was his parents' house in Stacksdorp, where he killed them both and set the house on fire sometime before midnight. Thirty minutes later, he arrived at the retirement home in Herva, where his ex-girlfriend worked and lived. He climbed a fire escape and entered the room where Osberg usually slept. This night, however, she was not sleeping there, but in the room of Agnes London, the matron. He discovered this, entered the room, and killed them both with an axe. After killing Osberg in London, he blocked the entrance to the retirement home and set it on fire. Four elderly people died in the flames, with a fifth dying some days later from severe burns. The police had realized by now that Heaton was behind the killings and had started a manhunt. They found his car parked near a local lake. In the front seat was a suicide note. The note contained a full confession of all his crimes and it ended with an explanation as to why he had killed his parents, so that they would not have to suffer for his crimes. Somewhat later, his weighted down body was found in Brosarp Lake near Skane County, where he had drowned himself. Heaton's corpse was transported to the Institution of Anatomy at Lund University. It was stored at the institution until 1974, when it was cremated. Before Anders Hansen got a job at Malma Ostra, he worked at Varenhem's hospital. In his report from Varenhem, they wrote, He does not take initiatives. He seems odd and he doesn't seem to understand what anyone tells him we shall not rehire him. Anders had a normal childhood, although his mother was overprotective and he was bullied. When asked about girls, he answered that he never had any feelings for girls and never thought of them in a way typical for boys his age. People described him as stupid and that he had an ugly smile. All of this must have had quite a negative effect on him as years later, Anders said that he would have continued murdering if he had not been caught though he also said that if he someday was freed, he would not take up the activity again, although he never felt bad for what he did. Anders had an IQ of 72, and it's noted that he didn't show emotions during the psychiatric assessment. The doctor said that he had symptoms of schizophrenia, but it wasn't enough to diagnose him. It was also mentioned that he had obsessive compulsive behaviors, and doctors stated that he was a danger to himself and others. Over a four-month period, several of the elderly chronically ill patients in Section 26 at Ostra Hospital in Malmö, Sweden fell sick and died of what seemed like natural causes. 
It wasn't until January 12, 1979 that they realized something more sinister was happening when a nurse heard a 94-year-old patient shouting that something was burning her throat. The caretaker and other members of the staff smelled her breath, which reeked of cleaning detergent. Concluding someone had been poisoning the patients, they locked the hospital down and waited for the police to arrive. One employee who immediately provided an explanation was 18-year-old Anders Hansen, an intellectually disabled boy described by colleagues as stupid and ridiculous for the constant lies he shared and his poor work performance. He claimed to have witnessed another patient leaning over the poisoned woman while fiddling with something in their pocket, and he maintained this story once he was transferred to the police station for questioning. During interrogation, he asked to go home so he wouldn't be late for supper, but then abruptly admitted to poisoning 15 people and murdering 27 others. Hansen would mix the detergents Ivasol and Gevasol with water or juice before giving it to a patient or sometimes forcing the cleaning agent directly down their throat. On October 6, 1978, a month after being hired, he committed his first murder by giving a 66-year-old blind man a massive dose of Ivasol because he felt sorry for him. He felt the patients led a meaningless life and believed the killings were merciful, adding, I could not stand to see some of the old people suffer, so I helped them die. All of the deaths could not be confirmed due to lack of evidence or cremation, so Hansen was convicted of 11 counts of murder and 16 attempted murders. He was sentenced to closed psychiatric care and has been released as of 1993. Matthias Flink was born and raised in Fallon, Sweden. His mother was a housewife and his father and grandfather worked as gunsmiths with their own shop. His parents divorced when he was nine years old and the divorce is described as having been calm and sensible. Flink chose to stay with his father in the family house while his mother moved to an apartment just a couple hundred meters from the house. According to psychological evaluations, his mother's departure left deep scars within Flink. It is said that Flink developed some kind of alienation towards women. Flink attended high school with focus on electrical mechanical studies. After his graduation, Flink enlisted as a conscript with the Dalarna Regiment. He committed himself to becoming an officer of the Swedish Army and was employed at Dalarna Regiment in 1993. During the spring of 1994, Flink had severe problems with his mental health, resulting in aggression, severe jealousy, sleeping disorders, and paranoia. This led to a total mental breakdown. He was reported as having been thrown out of a restaurant for bothering women. On June 11, 1994, 2nd Lieutenant Matthias Flink consumed a large amount of alcohol, then he went home to change his clothes. Dressed in his field uniform, he walked into his regiment. He equipped himself with his AK-5 assault rifle and 150 rounds of ammunition. Flink then set out for a park in downtown Fallon where he shot six members of the women's auxiliary services. The women were shot at random. Shortly thereafter, he shot two men, one cyclist and one security officer at a nearby road crossing. Sadly, six of the victims died immediately while one woman died in the hospital. One victim survived the attack. After the shootings, Flink sought refuge in a nearby crane. He remained there for some time before he made his way down to walk home along an abandoned railway. It was at this time that two policemen discovered him. Flink fired two rounds at the policeman, who then returned fire. Flink was hit in the hip and collapsed. At 3.25, Flink was apprehended and brought to Fallon Hospital. In the district court, the defense never questioned the prosecutor's description of the crime. The question for the defense was whether or not Flink was mentally ill at the time of the shooting. According to experts, Flink was in a self-inflicted temporary psychotic condition triggered by alcohol. If Flink was found to be mentally ill, he would not be able to be sentenced to prison. The final verdict came in Swedish Supreme Court. Matthias Flink was sentenced to life in prison. This precedent verdict made it possible for the courts in Sweden to sentence people to prison for crimes stemming from and committing during alcohol-induced psychosis. In January 2008, Flink requested that his life sentence be limited to 24 years. However, on September 3, 2008, 
a Rainbow Municipal Court rejected the request with the motivation that the circumstances regarding the case are exceptionally difficult and that a set time punishment has to greatly exceed 24 years. After some time of back and forth with the courts, Flink was sentenced to 32 years. On June 11, 2014, Flink was released from jail on the 20th anniversary of the shooting spree. Thanks for watching everybody. If you enjoyed this content, make sure to like, comment, and share the video. Stay safe out there.